Hello, it's uh, Dr. Jeffrey DeSarbo again. Uh, just to remind everybody, I'm a psychiatrist specializing in eating disorders, and I've kind of created this neuro series, uh, this 14 episode um, volume essentially, just to give everyone a background of this unique aspect of eating disorders with the neurobiology and the neuroscience of eating disorders. And this episode, again, is, it says the neuroscience of thought control, but it's, it's really the same thing as saying the neuroscience of mindfulness in many ways. So let's begin. I, I left off in the last neuro series where I was talking about a lot of the uh, neurobiology of medications and usefulness and not saying that there's really this main difference is just this one letter between the two words, but it makes a, a heck of a lot of difference as far as what each medication and meditation in addition to therapy, which was in the episode prior to that as well, um, contributes to the treatment of eating disorders. So um, I always, you know, bring up this thing is well, why is it important to con kind, of, kind of control your thoughts? We're never really taught that, especially in westernized uh, civilizations. You know, we're kind of raised and we kind of go out about our days and things happen and we react to it, you know, and more and more as time goes on and probably with the addition of technology especially, we've become very reactive in how we function throughout our days. Things happen, we react. Things happen, we react. And people are often struggling with downtime. So I often ask people this question um, and remind them, like, how hard is it to sit still? Because your existence... If you think about it, what you're, is really a sum total of your experience uh, of life, your quality of your existence is just what you think about from one moment to the next throughout your lifetime. I always use that analogy. If you, if you like to like just sit around and think about rainbows and you know pretty clouds and it makes you happy all the time and that's all you do for most of your life, the quality of your life will be a very good quality. But our minds are often going back saying we need to do more, the challenge is what's not good enough, what's not right. And that's the thing about learning to control your thoughts is learning to also be appreciative often for the things you have and we'll come back to that. So mindfulness, of course, the series is about the neurobiology of everything. And there's a lot of uh, imaging studies with MRIs, with SPECT scans, with other types of imaging studies that have shown the potential benefits of learning things like uh, yoga, breathing techniques, and especially meditation. Uh, and, and like just this one study here, what has neuroimaging taught us on, on the neurobiology of, of yoga, it shows that there's even cellular growth like in the brain in areas such as the insula hippocampus. I've mentioned these. It's not important for now. That prefrontal part of the brain, which is really our higher executive functioning regions. Um, so there's a lot of benefits that when they, we found through neuroimaging that creates these types of changes in the brain that help us function even better in life. And... I always say kind of like one of the goals is, is this right here, <laughs> um, you know, to be able to sit calmly and keep control of our mind and our thoughts and our kind of like even our heart rates and, and how we're functioning in life, e even when it seems like we're surrounded by danger or we're surrounded by multiple different types of stressors all hitting us at once. Um, and again, people having a reactive mind, never having training in how do you control your mind and thoughts breeds a lot of the types of anxieties, fears, depressions that we see in society today. And the study I even have at the bottom of the sign looked at the um, neuroanatomy of meditations and over 78 types of neuro investigations. And when I mentioned like people doing yoga too, they even found like different styles of yoga often lead to different places and regions of the brain that go through dramatic changes that can help people function and focus on things that don't lead to distractions that get in the way in life. Uh, this is just one little study here. It shows, like, if, if you look at the small picture of the brain, the circled area, it shows that when people practice meditation, the longer they do it, the greater there is an increase in the um, volume of brain cells in different parts of the brain. And in, in this part here, it's part of the frontal cortex. Um, they, they showed that, you know, if you practice uh, for 10 years, you get like almost uh, 
uh, a quarter of a millimeter, 0.25 millimeters uh, increase in cellular volume. So some people say 10 years, that's what I'm going to get as a quarter millimeter. What we're really talking about, though, is, is you know, millions and hundreds of millions of cellular connections and, and everything that help in areas that are important for focus and concentration and just keeping oneself um, motivated yet self-regulated. So with, I'm not going to go through these studies, but I just want to show that there are studies. There's newer ones as well. This is a slide I've used in a lot of my talks over the years. Uh, it shows you that with, with meditation, there's been increased gray matter volume in different regions. Um, and even on when they look at the multitude of studies, it shows that there's regions that are consistently altered in meditators um, that are especially important to awareness, uh, also self-awareness of the body, um, memory, uh, and self-emotional regulation, like I mentioned, uh, and improves connections between both sides, the right and the left hemispheres of the brain as well. And it, there are many other types of studies that have come about since. Sometimes I've heard people say there's not a lot of research out there that shows meditation is effective at all. I think there are a lot of studies actually out there that shows that it's effective just by the anatomy that takes place in, 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 in changes to the brain and the central nervous system as well um, that help people kind of feel more at ease within themselves. Um, I always like to show this study here, um, and, and, and without this is, includes the abstract from the study, and, and you can see I have in yellow that at age 50, the brains of meditators are estimated to be seven and a half years younger than those who are not meditators. And every additional year over 50, the meditators had another one month and 22 days younger than their chronological age. So... It's kind of showing that, look, if you practice meditation, you kind of get a younger, healthier brain longer in life. And, 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 the, and that also leads to a younger, healthier body in many ways because uh, it's not under constant stress, releasing those things like cortisol and other stress hormones and other things like limiting supplies of that BDNF, which I've referenced in past uh, talks. So there are different ways to get to that end result of meditation. That's kind of the ultimate form of mindfulness that you want to practice. And early on, you know, sometimes with therapists, sometimes with outside teachers and, and people to help train you, you can also practice things like diaphragmatic breathing, progressive mu muscle relaxation, yoga, tai chi, qigong, uh, guided imagery, positive affirmations. Uh, I've mentioned gratitude moments in the past as well and other mindfulness techniques and training, things that kind of help one learn how to control their mind. And oftentimes by controlling their mind, they're controlling their bodies. You know, I had read studies in the past how, you know, people like Buddhist monks are able to, you know, control their heart rates to just one or two or a few beats per minute. They can you can put someone in out in the snow in the dead of winter with a wet towel on their back and they can generate enough body heat to actually dry that towel. So learning how to control the mind actually can help control a lot of what goes on within the body. And we'll even sometimes run groups where people are, are, are able to learn how to sit and learn how to lower their heart rates by using some of these techniques. Now, like I mentioned, one of the things is we have these reactive minds in society and I always want to ask people, you know, kind of like, how long can you sit still and do nothing? Because the harder it is to sit still and do nothing, the harder that life experience will be. And what you often see with eating disorders is people feel, I always need to be productive. I always need to be moving. And in fact, when I recommend things like meditation, relaxation exercises, yoga, that's, that's not exercise-based but more meditative in nature, and someone says to me, I can't, I can't do that. I hate doing that. All that means to me is you haven't developed enough in the brain regions to be able to accomplish that task yet. So you have to sometimes start off with very slow, very basic exercises. And there's a lot of apps out there right now that people, that become very popular because people do seem to want to learn to self-regulate and control themselves. But, you know, they do need to keep it going for a long period of time 
so they actually master controlling their thoughts. But it's very important, like I said. If, that's why oftentimes people are coming to me saying, is there any medication I can take? Because, you know, I don't have, you know, three, four, five, ten years to wait to, to, to really be able to control how I feel about everything. The good thing about these types of techniques is you usually start to reap the benefits actually within a few weeks, you know. So so that you start feeling you have more control over how you're feeling and your own self-regulation, but it can take years to develop it where it's something you barely have to even think about. Um, in addition to using some of these techniques, there are things out there like uh, biofeedback uh, units, neurofeedback units that you can often look up and get online that'll show you like physiological um, measurements of how well your body's responding to the practice of mindfulness. And even there's some, a lot of articles out there that show it has been effective for the treatment of eating disorders and symptoms related to it. Um, and, you know, I just listed a couple of studies here and everything. And, you know, there's even a, a, a lot of research going on at one um, uh, residential treatment center actually out in Utah that's doing a lot to try to see, well, what can we do? How does the brain change and how can we affect effective change using neurofeedback and, and, and QEEG units to help somebody kind of go through recovery and actually see the changes that are taking place within how their brain is processing information. So mindfulness goes back to that concept of I don't want to react to everything there is out in the world. You know, I'll never forget once I was running a, a um, conference and I, and I started, there was an intermission, everyone had lunch, we came back in and I said, I'm going to start doing a talk right now on mindfulness and what I want to do is I want everyone to relax, take a deep breath, put their feet on the floor, close their eyes and just breathe in gently and out and we're going to do that now for 20 minutes. And I just watched everyone squirm in their seats, and they couldn't do it. I, later, I, one of my patients was there with her parent, and she said, as soon as we heard 20 minutes, we have to do this, we were saying, do you think we can sneak out? So again, that ability to sit still and do nothing and control your thoughts is, is really an important aspect, not just for life in general, but as it relates to controlling and treating eating disorders, because as you've been watching this neuro series, I hope you've been understanding that a lot of the things with eating disorders is the brain is kind of going off on its own in a haywire fashion. And the more you can help someone learn to control that firing, the better their recovery will become and the more resistant to relapse the individual will become. Uh, so I'm going uh, to continue on to neuro series episode 12 next. Uh, the neuromedical connection, kind of like the interactions between the brain, central nervous system, and the body, and all the body systems. So please continue with that. And like always, uh, if you need to reach us for any of these things, here's some of our contact information. Um, thank you.